from 1960s to now, how much has changed so far to you? Well, public accommodations have changed, which means that you're no longer publicly humiliated. Can't use a library, can't use a restaurant, can't use a toilet, can't drink water. That's just barbarism. We won that battle. You can travel from here to Wilmington, to Washington, to Memphis, to back, and use any hotel, motel, like that has changed. The right to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, the resistance to our movement is very intense now. But at least we have a weapon with which to fight. When we use that, those, that weapon, we win. That's the value, that's the, 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 that's the lesson in Alabama and, and Virginia, because we once can only hope to win. Now we can vote to win. Well, the Greensboro Four were heroes to those of us who were at Dudley High School. When they got involved, automatically, we were going to get involved too. It's kind of interesting when I think back because I was really afraid. And then back in May of 1963, when we should have been graduating from high school, well, we were out marching. And so we blocked the entrance to the, uh, the S&W cafeteria and would not let people come in or out, so they put us in jail. There were so many of us there, students, that uh, the sheriff couldn't feed us all. He was bringing out peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So the doctors, the lawyers, the preachers, the ministers, and people like that in our community started cooking food, good old fried chicken, down-home food, and bringing it down there to the polio hospital. And as they started to feed us, they had to feed the jailers too because the jailers were having a hard time standing there watching us eat all this good food. These were 18-year-old young men and students who were 17, 18 years old, even some of the high school students here. So no, I don't think you ever know that. Uh, but all you want to do is, while you do your work and what you do, you want to make sure that you do what your heart tells you to do is the right thing to do. And then to look back and see this impact. I was the first African-American woman elected to the Greensboro School Board. I'm the first African-American woman to uh, represent the 12th Congressional District. Hopefully, we'll be able to look back many years um, later and see some of the impact that we've made. What did your daughters learn about your father, your, their grandfather? Mm -hmm. uh, well, through me, mm -hmm. and to, to this day, I really don't think they understand like I do. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me a while. They both have seen the, the statues uh, over at ENT that mm -hmm. I remember when they were unveiled and, and when they, they uh, took the sheet off of it and I, I saw it for the first time. I looked up and it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the sun started shining. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was um, kind of like dad's looking down at me. When you first heard Martin Luther King's speech in Montgomery, Alabama, how were the feelings and the emotions when you first heard him? I was excited. I had heard about him, I had read about him and I was waiting to have an opportunity to meet him in person mm -hmm. and to hear him speak. And, and of course, this the first time I heard him, he was preaching uh, at his church. And uh, I really enjoyed that. That evening, I was standing in, living in Maryland Hall. And I decided I was going to see him. So I sneaked in the chapel, mm -hmm. went up in an area mm -hmm. where the choir stand and Christ, Christ stand. And when he was speaking, I was looking at him. Do you believe that there should be more change in the union working and the process of that? More change in the unions working, yes. Uh, we, we have to, as, as, a, as a political entity in a democratic society, uh, have to be more engaged in the public policy side of, of, the, uh, of the government's activity. Some of you may know who I am, while others don't. And if you don't, my name is Charlotte Fortin. I was born into a wealthy black abolitionist family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I attended grammar school and normal school. I developed a love for poetry, mostly which focused on anti-slavery. Like many of the women in my family, I became a teacher. In 1862, I joined with teachers, black and white, to teach enslaved children in South Carolina. I was determined to change the lives of all African Americans and promise my people freedom 
and education. It was a hard task nonetheless. Recruiting new students, I came across my first student named Jacob, who was very determined and well-rounded. I also did more activist work besides the one I did in South Carolina. I became a member of the Salem Female Anti-Slavery Society, which was involved in fundraising as well. I moved to Washington, D.C., where I suddenly passed away. A couple years after my passing, I heard that they was doing a movie on me. <laughs> it was very nice to hear, thanks to Paul Brock. This is Charlotte Fortin, and this was my life. Good afternoon. My name is Meredith Jenkins, and welcome to Black History Minute. Today's inspiring black woman is Sarah Breed, but we all know her as Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was born on December 23, 1867, near Plantation in Delta, Louisiana. She was born a free slave with her parents who died early, but since she was only seven years old, she was sent to be raised with her sister and brother-in-law. They moved to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where they all picked cotton on a plantation. In order to escape the rough environment, she married a man named Moses McWilliams at the age of 14 and started a new job, earning only $150. Eventually, Madam C.J. Walker became the first African-American woman to create her own line for women of color. She was inspired by herself when she suffered from scalp ailment that led to her losing some of her hair, which inspired her to make remedies for black women. In 1905, she created her remedies. In 1908, she owned her own factory and sold her products around the world. She died in 1919 at the age of 51 from hypertension, but Madam C.J. Walker, we sisters, we appreciate you and your self-made contribution to the African-American women.